Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chandra and I work at the Penticton Museum and I'm happy that we are able to bring you today the Brown Bag Lecture. And the Brown Bag Lecture is a presentation that happens every Tuesdays uh, from September all the way through to April and we have topics that cover um, history of course, uh, community issues, and uh, also um, things that are really interesting like the history of Fairview. And so I am happy to introduce today Larry Shannon, who's come up all the way from Oliver, and uh, he is going to talk, I know, all the way from Oliver. It's, and I think he's got a lot of fans in the crowd. And he's going to talk to us today about the history of Fairview. Uh, Larry is, uh, as, grew, grew up in Oliver, right, and, uh, and is a his, uh, likes local history and interested in local history and also likes to go hiking i'm guessing based on uh, some of the people in the crowd i like the outdoors yes yeah. i do enjoys the outdoors and seen a lot of the outdoors around here so without further ado i'll hand it over to larry thank you chandra well as Chandra mentioned, I grew up in Oliver. I did a lot of hiking in the hills around Oliver, and for some reason, I became interested in local history. They say different strokes for different folks, and uh, mine happened to be local history, or one of the things I like. And the Fairview was uh, uh, a bit of a mystery to me when I was a kid. I was aware of the old mines and buildings hiking around, but I didn't know too much about it, and there was very little remaining. But an awful lot happened there around the turn of the century. And the more I looked into it, the more I found out about it. And I've been trying to research it for a long time. I, it had its own newspaper at one time, and I was actually, remember back in the 90s, I'd, I'd get a motel and go down to Victoria, and I'd go in the archives and read the newspaper and photocopy the microfiche and things like that. And now a lot of the information is available online. Um, so the slide we're looking at is, is the Fairview Town site. That was taken around uh, 1898. And Fairview went through several boom and bust periods like lots of mining towns. Um, we know this picture was taken around, it's about two mile, two or three miles west of Oliver, just where the hills start at the mouth of Reed Creek, which flows down into the Okanagan Valley. Um, the, we know it was taken around 1898. There's, if we look over here, it's very small, but that is the Fairview, Hotel Fairview. That is quite a big building, a very big building actually. It was built in 1897, 98, and burned down in 1902. So we know the photograph was taken between those two dates. And this building here is the Church of England, and that was uh, built in, about, in early 1898. And uh, right beside it, there was another church, the Presbyterian Church, built in 18, later in 1899, and the second church isn't built. So we know it was probably taken late 1898 or early 1899. And uh, it's, uh, quite a, it was quite a busy town at that time. Um, but the, before the gold mining started, we have to, I think it's really important to recognize it's not as though the land was unoccupied. The silt people occupied the land for thousands of years. They wandered through all the hills and they used it to support their communities. In uh, 1811, the first Europeans arrived. They were fur traders from the Astor Fur Company, but they, um, they, they were mainly Canadians, but the American fellow had started a fur company. And they came up the Okanagan Valley and they started, uh, a regular fur brigade route that went from Fort Okanagan on the Columbia River right up to northern BC. So from about 1812 to about 1850, there were actually fur brigades, long brigades going through this land right here. There were, there's a couple of routes, but one of them came right up across the town site and followed Willowbrook Road north up to Twin Lakes. Um, after, when the border was set up, that was less viable. Um, after that, um, the, a lot of the miners from California were coming up in Oregon to, to going to Barkerville. And the Americans started calling this, the, what we called the Brigade Trail, the, uh, the Caribou Trail. And so there were large groups of American miners coming through. And then after that, um, the, the ranchers moved in, and this was uh, ranch land 
owned by Judge Haynes and also by the Ellis family later on. So that was sort of the occupation of this area before the town site started. Um, the name, uh, Fairview was originally referred to as New Camp uh, to distinguish it from Camp McKinney, which was a few years older on the other side of the valley, a mining camp. It was also called uh, Camp Okanagan or Okanagan Quartz Camp. And it was called Quartz Camp because all the gold in the Fairview area is in the quartz. There was no placer mining there. Sometimes the quartz had what's called free gold, which means there's little flakes of gold in the quartz. And then when you can get the gold from the quartz by just pounding it to a pulp and then just sluicing it in a gold pan or sluicing techniques, and you can separate the gold from the quartz. But more often, the gold is in the quartz and it has to be separated with adding cyanide and, and mercury and things like that. Um, and a, apparently a group of locals celebrating Christmas Eve at Moffat Saloon, which is located up the gulch from the, the main town site, uh, in 1889 decided that camp should have a better name and they came up with Fairview. And the first time I have seen Fairview mentioned as a name was in the Vernon newspaper in 1891. Um, early days of Fairview. Mining activity began in 1887 and there was a lot of hype. There were, there were pock, people who discovered pockets of quartz veins with a lot of good rich ore in there. And um, the early mines were small, low-budget operations. Um, this picture, I think, was taken in 1895, and this is the Winchester claim, and you can see he's just got a shaft there. And in 1895, the provincial government uh, sent a team of people around to around southern BC to just document the mining activity. They took quite a few photographs, and these photographs are now in the BC archives. So this photograph came from the BC archives, but they've got a good selection of Fairview photographs taken in 1895. I just thought that's sort of a classic photo, a miner standing above a shaft, and that's what they looked like then. This is another uh, mining operation, and this is the smuggler mine, which is actually off to the left. And what is going on here, they didn't have stamp mills or water or steam-powered stamp mills to pound the ore down, to crush it down to slurry, and they have a horse rotating a sort of a drum inside the drum, just to grind the earth down. That was, that's a primitive stamp mill, that's what that is, but that's what they were doing. In 1892, 1893, an outfit called the Strathware Mining Company came in. Uh, Sir Charles Tupper, who was actually, this is before he was a Prime Minister of Canada, he was the Canada's envoy to Britain. Um, some of Shaughnessy's from the Shaughnessy Railroad family were involved, and also some big English money, and they were looking to invest in gold in Canada, and they did their research, and they decided Fairview is where they wanted to be. So all of a sudden, these poor miners, there's not much cash floating around. People are coming in with lots of dollars, and they're spending it. Uh, they bought, right off the top, they bought four, about five claims. They paid about $15,000 was the most expensive they paid at, at that time. But as you can imagine, someone coming in and dropping $15 for one claim was made a, made a bit of a hit in the town. Uh, they, they were well funded, and the, the house up top, that was always called the Blue House, and that was certainly the nicest building south of Penticton, and maybe even north of Penticton too at the time. That would have been 1892, 1893. And that's where the mine managers stayed, and uh, they lived there, and also the offices. And the uh, one of the, when Strathroy did pull out, which they did, which happened often, one of the complaints was they spent too much money above ground and not enough in the ground. They built big fancy buildings, but didn't do enough digging and looking for veins. Um, that house, in I think it was 1906 or 1907, the Strathroy Company had since, long since, since shut down, but they, um, they sold it to uh, Peter McIntyre, and he hired a contractor, Dalrymple, and that house was relocated to below McIntyre Buff. That's what we've always called it. It has another name now, I can't pronounce it. And uh, the McIntyres used it, and then at about 1937, it burned down, and they think what happened, it had been empty, and some hobo, it was during the Depression era, and some hobos had been staying in it, and it was a rainy night, they had a little fire, and poof, it went. So that house was actually moved to McIntyre Bluff later on. This is the mill, this part of the stamp mill that the Strathair Company built lower down. That is a, 
is you, you go up past the house, up the gulch, just past Dumay's place, and uh, you go up maybe uh, half a kilometer, and there's a sharp right-hand turn. That house is just a, above the right-hand turn on the right-hand side. And this is Reed Creek here. This is probably only a, a you know, just, well, just under half a kilometer up the gulch. It's quite low down um, there. And, and there, they bought the Rattler claim and some other claims which were close by. There were a lot of claims farther back up on that side valley. Uh, this is the Stem Miner Mine, which is often called the, uh, the claim, the Discovery Claim. It was the first really successful one, 1897. Uh, it operated 1887 to 1908 as a mine. In later years, in the 30s and 40s, there's other mining in the area, but sometimes more modern companies group a few claims together and, and did a bit of work. It was uh, located approximately four kilometers up the gulch, and there's different statistics out there, but a BC government report I read recently said 103,000 grams of gold and 533 grams of silver came out of that mine, plus uh, some lead and zinc as well. Um, I'll talk, well, it was interesting because it kept, the people that owned it uh, would kept finding rich ore and they'd raise more money and they'd spend more money just to improve it, but it's the kind of thing where you never could quite really start making lots of money, but a lot of money was spent there. I mean, it did produce gold, but the investors never really got great dividends out of it. It employed a lot of people and uh, its payroll was a big part of Fairview's economy. This is the uh, Moffat Saloon Fairview Hotel. This was sort of the first hotel and drinking establishment in Fairview. It's located up the gulch, close to where the Stem Miner Mine was. Uh, it was open in, I think, 1888, and then 10 rooms were added in 1892, and it became a hotel. And it was a popular host and the center of social life in the early days of Fairview. And Andrew Mo or John Moffat is buried in the old Fairview Cemetery, which is a, sort of a a rough cemetery in the hills, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. And I just had a couple other photographs. So this was taken around 1895 or something like that. Um, in 1979, you can see the buildings, these two buildings. And then in 2017, you know, that's why I say the town that was. Uh, buildings which weren't, uh, were left alone, have fallen apart, but many of the buildings from Fairview in the early 20s were, uh, salvaged by people. The irrigation project came in and people were taking the buildings and lumber and putting them, uh, reusing them for different things. Sort of sad that these things happen, but that's nature. Uh, there were several hotels. The Golden Gate Hotel was sort of uh, one of the main hotels in town. It built in 1892-1893. Um, this, I think this photo is sometimes called waiting for the mail. When the mail stage came in, people would go down there. It was the original one, a bit of a log building, a bit rough. Uh, this is the Golden Gate Hotel in 1915. Uh, and that time, uh, the Jones family, a prominent family at Fairview, had purchased it. And uh, they, there was another hotel called the Columbia House. And uh, uh, they just abandoned the old log one. And the, the por portion on the left was the old Columbia House Hotel. And then they um, extended it. And like the governor general of Canada stopped and had lunch there. And like this was, uh, I don't know how often the governor general of Canada had lunch at Oliver, but he, he was in Fairview in 1915 sort of thing. And, uh, and there's a few more stories about that coming up, but that was a, a prominent building and a pr very prominent long time business at Fairview. Uh, this is the classic hotel Fairview, um, really a prominent building. Uh, and it was destroyed by fire in 1902. I'll talk a bit more about the fire later on. It was not rebuilt because mining activity by 1902 was decreasing. Um, and they, had, they brought in like professional acts. Pauline Johnson, who was actually, she was uh, part Mohawk, but she was a performing artist, is what we'd call her now, dance and poetry. And she performed all over North America, New York, back east. She, uh, she performed here, they brought her in. And, uh, I read that she, she uh, was paid $25, and some people at the time thought that was a bit steep. But, but um, the, it, Fairview had sort of developed into, uh, like there was the miners and the working class in a way, but there was also professionals, the administrators, the engineers, they're often educated in England, and they were slightly, had a bit more money to spend, and they certainly 
hung out in this hotel, and there were people would often board in this hotel too. It wasn't all overnight guests. But I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, First Nations interactions with Fairview. I call them independent neighbors. Um, I won't go through those. You can sort of read the things they did. And uh, they, they never worked in the mines as such. Um, I did see one court case where a mine owner was being sued for bad debts. And one of the people who was on the list was, was a, a native fellow, a native name for sure. But I don't think it would have been for working in the mines, but he maybe provides some freighting services for them. But they were, they were interacting, but they were still independent. And it was, you know, it was, in some ways it was still their land. I would like that photo, that came from a private collection. And I just think that's a, a good looking, proud cowboy that looks after himself. You know, I, I just saw that and I liked it. And um, I've since found out there's a good chance, I thought it might be somebody from the Inkini Pursuit Band, but I've since found out it's probably Hans Richter, who was, uh, a very, became a very well-known cowboy from the Richter family in the uh, South Smil Commune in the Okanagan. He was a good friend of Val Haynes. Schools. Uh, First school opened 1897. It was in a half-abandoned dugout miner shack. The first teacher was Miss Rose Glover. She was a 17-year-old from the North Okanagan, and she had done well in school and passed some exams, not really qualified. And they, uh, they were looking for a teacher in, all, in Fairview. They had kids, didn't even have a school. And uh, it turned out that the Shatford family, which is very prominent in the whole Okanagan Valley, they're, BC history, Okanagan is Vernon. But the Shatfords had a store with staff in Fairview and they got involved. And the, this lady's family in Vernon knew one of the Shatfords and they, she sort of got recruited to come to Fairview. And it, the family was a bit nervous about their 17 year old daughter coming to this sort of rough mining town. And she was a bit nervous too. But she came down, she's always said she was treated with the greatest respect. The kids were very well behaved. The older kids kept the stove going. Um, and she got involved in the community. And I don't think she stayed too long in Fairview, but later on in life, she retired, was living in North Vancouver, and uh, she's got all these photographs. And it was either her or one of her sons gave her photographs to the Vancouver City Archives. So now the, the Major Matthews collection, Major Matthews is a very prominent archivist in uh, Vancouver. He, uh, there, there's a good collection of Fairview photographs in the Vancouver Archives, largely as a result of Miss Glover's picture taking. And she was involved in musical productions, teaching Sunday school and all that, and uh, apparently had a very good experience there. Uh, after leaving that dugout, they spent one year in the Church of England, which was the, the first church built, and then this was the first school built in Fairview in 1899. And that was luxury. The photo was not great, but the, the building was luxury. Um, now, uh, fires at Fairview, fires in mining towns is always sort of interesting. Um, when the Hotel Fairview burned down, it really was a big story through, uh, basically it made the Victoria newspapers, Victoria colonists, and certainly in the interior. And um, there were three lives lost and also a lot of uh, injuries. A lot of people escaped, of course. And I, I had that last sentence there because I came across that pretty recently. but. I guess for, you know, they were trying to figure out why, why it happened. And, and people in the upper, the fire was in the lower level and people in the upper floor were trapped. And I, I guess they did put roads, uh, ropes out the windows so you could escape, but they had taken the ropes down and uh, that was a big problem. Uh, one of the people that died uh, was Louisa Smith and she was a school teacher. And, um, yeah, and the other, another one, I guess I was thinking, uh, was a housekeeper, and she um, she ended up jumping out of the third floor window and hurting her. She had basically died from her, her injuries of her fall. And the cook from the hotel uh, was a Chinese fellow, and he escaped. And uh, he, he saw her there, and he didn't know what to do, but she was sort of, I guess, not fully clad or anything like that. And it, it wasn't be, be, be appropriate for him to be around this lady lying there, but he went back into the hotel and put a blanket on her, and she was still alive. She didn't die right away. At least uh, Hunt, her name was. And, uh, he, and he didn't say anything else. And uh, about two days after the fire, they were talking, and the people, the sort of leading citizens of the community, you know, 
how did she get the blanket on her? What happened there? And then they found out it was the uh, the Chinese cook had done that, and he hadn't said a word to anybody. And when it was reported in the papers, it was saying it was a very honorable thing this Chinese fellow did by not making a scene, by covering her up. Um, the second fire uh, is, is quite interesting too, quite tragic. When the uh, Golden Gate Hotel moved to its new location, the new building, and they had a, a great big party and people were coming from the smell community and everything, the Jones were really well known and Golden Gate was a prominent hotel. And uh, just behind it were the uh, a large stables owned by the McDougall and Hine family. And that McDougall family, they have descendants living in Penticton. Are there any McDougalls here at all? Anyway, the, the, uh, the whole uh, stable, which was a great big building, went up and all, a lot of uh, people lost their favorite horses, a lot of tack and everything. It was a very tragic fire, but the hotel didn't get burned. Um, there, another fire, a boarding house burned in 1902. And it's interesting because we hear about forest fires and communities burning all the time now, but I've never come across where Fairview itself felt threatened by a forest fire. Now, you know, there's a fire, they're vacating half the town saying it's a big problem and all that stuff. In those days, it, there were a few fires, but the, uh, I just didn't come across any. There were some bigger forest fires, but... Um, if anybody wants to ask a question or something, I'll, I'll take a break here. Very, very close. It's very close. We're going to see a picture of the church that was on that site. But this, I'm going to guess this is within uh, 400 feet of it. 400 feet down the other. Um, did, you, did you have something to add to that? I was going to ask a question when you're done. Okay. Um, I think it, this was located to the south of the kiosk site. Gotcha. Okay. What does the word belch mean? I've always used that word, but I know it's not well. It's it's sort of a, a valley. I think it's common in the western in the western states. It's a small canyon or, or a valley. It was well, usually with steep sides. I'm curious, who who here? Am I the only one that uses the term gulch? Is it well used? Do people know what I meant? Yeah, it's like a ravine. It's like a and, and where the the, um, the creek comes out of the hills. It's fairly narrow, so I called it a gulch, and that's just a term I've used. Yeah, yeah. A, a broad valley wouldn't be called the gulch, but a narrow one could be called. At one time, there were five operating at one time. I'm just going to talk about this uh, in this slide here a bit more. Um, and I got, I'll talk about the tin horn in a few minutes. But yeah, there, the next stage after you had mined, the prospector would discover a mine or a claim, prove rich ore. He'd hope for somebody or a company with big bucks to move in and then they're going to make all their shareholders money and uh, they would invest money and, and expand the mine and build a stamp mill so they could do things in scale and make a real real operation out of it. So mining companies are promoters. So basically what the Strathair company moved in about 1890, late 1892. They spent a bundle of money and uh, they built a stamp mill and all of a sudden the big boys realized they weren't making money. And in 1894, they basically cut back, stopped spending. So some of the locals were disappointed. As I mentioned before, they said they spent the money wrong, they built big houses not in the ground, but they did their analysis and said, we're out of here. And so that was the first, it was a real boom when the Strathair Company came in and a real bust when they went down. But they didn't go down, they just, they, were, they didn't invest any more money and they weren't making money. So a few years later, um, a new group of mining promoters established themselves at Fairview they formed companies, sold stock, uh, bought claims from prospectors who were only too happy to sell for them, sell them. And sometimes the promoters would state claims and sell the claims to the company too and get their bucks. So even if the company made money, didn't make money, the, the people that started the, uh, the company did. And uh, the Quintinhorn Quartz Mining Company was a great example of this. And this photo is from an 1899 article in the Victoria Times. So if people have been there, this is actually a sketch of what they had, but it doesn't look like that now. Um, and 
I was, I've been hiking to the Tinhorn Stamp Mill. I was raised in an orchard just below it, so I'm quite familiar with it. I've spent a lot of time there over the years. Um, I know I'm going to read this out because I just think this is, this was an article written at the time, and I know you shouldn't read from PowerPoint, but this is really interesting. It's a quote from the Boundary Creek Times, 1897. And these are, this is just from the Kootenays, what they know about the mining industry. And this newspaper fellow says, possibly never in the history of mining did the general public display a greater degree of greed for mining stock than in the case of the tin horn. This company was organized by Messrs. Dyer, Dyer, Davidson and Russell, and before a pound of ore was treated, before the mill was erected, orders came from the east, from the coast, from every city for thousands of shares, more than the company had to give. The company was threatened of lawsuits because they couldn't deliver all the shares that they promised. The shares were issued at 25 cents about six months ago, and today they are selling for $1.70. Of course, the speculative public are like a flock of sheep, and where one plunges, the rest are sure to follow. But the Tinorn property has been examined by experts representing Eastern shareholders, and the results are always favorable. We got lots of gold, right? <laughs> yeah, a bit of cynicism there you might pick up. As suspected by some, the ore from the Tinorn mineral claims did not contain as much gold as promised, and the stamp mill was expensive to operate. The operation lasted about two years. Now this scenario played out for several properties at February. However, in the process, there were lots of funds invested in, in the mines and the community prospered. These people are all spending money galore in there, and, uh, but they don't get it. There were only really two mines that really survived all this. But it was, that's, that was, I think some people think the mining industry is a bit like that today. I can't comment on that, but. <laughs> This is a picture of the Tin Horn Stamp Mill today. And it was, there was a, a lot of money invested there at, at one time. Um, crime at Fairview. Very little gunplay. Like, there were American towns across the border. They called at Loomiston. Loomiston, we call it Loomis now. And uh, there was a bit of gunplay down there, but very little gunplay. Uh, and major crime at Fairview. There was the British government, sort of the BC government and the British tradition and law and order. Uh, one, attempt, one attempt in gold robbery, Steve Magnet, who is a prominent uh, miner, he came over from Cap McKinney, he owned the Morning Star claim and he had, it was a good mine. He didn't sell out to the Strathair Company because he wanted 50,000 bucks for his mine and they were only paying 14,000 for other good ones. But he, you know, I, I, he thought he had a gold mine. He did have a gold mine. And, um, the, uh, he was apparently got up early one morning and he, was, he, he had a lot of free gold in his property too, but he was taking some gold bricks, he had them wrapped in a saddlebag and taken them up to Penticton to a bank or to ship out on the Sycamus or something. And uh, somebody, he thought he didn't know about it, but somebody came out with a gun and uh, tried to rob him up and he reacted quickly and he hopped on his horse and he, did, he escaped and the guy chased him, but he said he didn't stop riding for a long time. And I haven't read that one in a newspaper. That is recounted in a story that Steve told this person who wrote up the article. Um, the only gunplay, and this is has a, a little bit of a contemporary twist to it, it's uh, domestic violence. Uh, James McCaig and his wife uh, split up that argument and he lived at Fairview. And, and so the, there was a child involved and uh, James had, had taken the child, and the wife was madder in blazes. And uh, the council at that time, the, the council, the police services were moved to Fairview around 1898, just in this next boom. But the constable came up from Fairview, up from Asuyas, to arrest James McCaig. But the wife, she wasn't waiting for that, and she got herself a gun, and she went looking for him. So she's around Fairview looking for him, and he was out at the, he was uh, staying in the boarding house at the Joe Dandy Mill. Joe Dandy mine site, which was just outside of Fairview, and she went out there and she shot him at close range, but I, I, it wasn't a good shot or the bullet bounced off a river or something. But there's this lady running around with a gun in Fairview, and I guess the whole town, we just couldn't believe it. I mean, this was not Fairview, right? But it was, and uh, and it's, the story ends where the constable took both of them back to the jail in a, in a suyus. <laughs> um, there are civil cases related to debts. Uh, and a uh, $700 theft from a drugstore, and it was uh, an employee of the drugstore, but well, that was a big deal. That was pretty close to the time the uh, Hotel Fairview burned down too, so it was a big deal. There was one a bit of horse stealing and cattle 
rustling. Apparently, a Swinburne uh, uh, butcher at Fairview named Swinburne, he bought a bunch of sheep uh, for butchering and some cattle too. And instead of paying the, he'd been in Fairview for a while, instead of paying for them, he just took them all across the line and he escaped, I think. So that kind of thing was happening. Uh, and there was also things like um, Mr. Elliott, who owned a, uh, a store, was arrested for having a lewd picture in it. You know, I guess he had got a calendar type picture of a pretty girl or something like that, but it was considered not appropriate for the, the, the laws of the time. So, you know, that's the kind of thing they dealt with as well. Uh, community and social activities. They had a Victoria Day and Dominion Day events. And for any younger people here, what we now call Canada Day was always ca called Dominion Day for many, many years in Canada, probably until the 60s. So that's like the Canada Day event. Horse races were a big thing. The uh, neighbor, Inconeep neighbors would join in, people from the States, people from Penticton. I've got some pictures coming up of that. And um, in 1903, they had built these cyanide uh, vats, big tanks, to try and get, treat the ore, to get more gold from the ore. They were 36 feet in diameter and 10 feet high, and they had uh, two of them. So the miners decided we'll have a party, and between them they put some chairs and a table, and they, uh, it was an orchestra, they called it orchestra, but fiddle players, and people were, were, having, were dancing in the vats. You know, it was just like a community an event. And the interesting thing is, one of the vats where people were drinking and partying were quite rowdy, and the other was the, the non-drinking vat, it was quieter. And after that, the, the, the miners called the, the non-drinking vat, they said, that's the Methodist tub. And then the other one was the, uh, the, the rather. But, uh, you know, it, was, it shows the community spirit, you know, they're gonna have a party to celebrate the finishing of these tubs. Um, there were, in church and community choirs, they had musical productions and like, Pirates of Penzance and that stuff was going on in later years. Uh, there's a picture of a horse race gathering. Uh, tennis, anyone? There, this was more or less the English, the government people, they were the more tennis people, but this, is, this was part of the community. Like, we're talking a real community here. Uh, it's like a board of trade thing, I think, of people from Moraville and Loomis coming up and they're having a meeting and celebrating the, the flags of the different countries. Uh, other social activities. Uh, this was a comment. The skating in the river at the bridge so it was good, or uh, the sleighing was good, and they were skating in the river. So they, they would still do these recreation things as groups go down there. And uh, the second comment, I don't know if that's a social activity, but I, it's the only time I've seen this mentioned in my research. I think it's uh, the red light who is possession of a house between the Stemwinder Mine and Fairview is still a source of danger and a hindrance to all good work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that would make sense because the stem winder had a boarding house where the single miners lived and Fairview was lower down the flat. So she, she wasn't in the town, but she wasn't at the mine. But uh, and that's, you always hear about red lights and prostitution at the old mining camps and things, but this is the only reference I've seen to that. But that's what it said in the paper. And the tone of it's rather interesting. It's a hindrance to good work. Uh, health and medical. Dr. Boyce and Dr. White were, were very respected and very popular physicians of, um, at Fairview. Dr. Boyce, uh, the Strathair Company brought him out in 1892 because they were investing all this money in the mining company and he was just a recent graduate from McGill. And he did, when the Strathair Company pulled out, he left and went to Kelowna and he became a very prominent physician in Kelowna for many years uh, and very well known, very well liked. And he used to talk about the old days. And when he, he was one story of Fairview he liked to tell. And uh, so it was shortly after he arrived and there was in a, a bar and there was people playing the fiddles and music. And one old miner said to him, I'll pay $500 to anybody that give my hearing back. And uh, Dr. Boyce knew this was one of the guys that had sold the claim. He knew he had the money. And so Dr. Boyce had an idea. Anybody have any want to guess of what Dr. Boyce's idea was here? Impact at earwax. So, so Dr. Boyce uh, took him aside and uh, cleaned out his ears. And he came back and he said, I can hear the music, he said, but I'm not going to pay you till tomorrow morning. If I can hear it, if I can still hear tomorrow morning, I'll give you your money. So the next morning he comes back to Dr. Boyce's office. He says, I can hear you, he says, 
but my damn pocket watch kept me awake all night. <laughs> and Dr. Boyce took his $500. Uh, Dr. White actually moved to Penticton after Fairview, and at the White Clinic is his, I think his, Dr. White, and then his son, all speaking physicians, and they're very respected members of the pioneer Penticton community, and uh, Dr. White married a member of the Haynes family, Hester Haynes, I think, and very well known and very well respected. Uh, diphtheria and typhoid epidemics were pretty common. In fact, at one time, Fairview developed a reputation for having these little epidemics popping up all the time, and it, they weren't happy about it, but it happened. Uh, the doctors, there was, wasn't, things weren't gentle, where it was ax, mining accidents, amputations, uh, serious injuries, dealing with uh, epidemics. The uh, doctors also would deal with things on the reserve as well, uh, with the Inconeep. They didn't uh, strict to the town site. Miners' consumption, consumption was a common chronic and sometimes fatal disease suffered by those that worked in the dusty and damp mines. And, and um, it's chronic, it's long term. You might be good to your 40 and just get sick. That's the way I understand it anyway. And then just when the, the second boom was happening, when these mining promoters were moving in, more hotels being built, they actually had a site chosen for hospital and a contract for construction given, but it was never built because people could see the bus coming again. All of a sudden, these mines aren't making quite as much money as they were promised. Government services. Uh, basically, the government services had been in a suyas, and around when 1898, they were, everything was moving to uh, Fairview, uh, nice houses. Um, and then eventually when Fairview died, it was slow to move, but they moved up to Penticton. And uh, J.R. Brown uh, was a, like a, he was not quite the government agent, he was one step down, and then he was, but he was a government sort of person and a magistrate in, in Fairview. And as, um, as Fairview started dying out, uh, he was left there. And Penticton, I know at one time thought, you've got to move these services to Penticton because it was growing. But this one story, um, the Fraser family is a prominent pioneer family in Asuyas, in the orcharding. Uh, George Fraser, some of us know, uh, his father, Doug Fraser. And in 1923, Doug Fraser tells, the Fraser family tells the story of Doug. He was 15 years old. He rode his bicycle from Asuyas to Fairview to get a hunting license because apparently J.R. Brown, the old magistrate, was the only person in BC that didn't know the, hunting, the age for a hunting license had been raised to 16 from 15. So, <laughs> So Doug could have got his license in Asuyas, but he rode his bicycle up to Fairview to talk to old Mr. Brown to get his, uh, and he got it. Uh, the post office, which is sort of the last main government facility, closed in 1925. Um, in the early days, church ministers visited. Uh, church of England built in 1898. That church hall was sold to Louis Dayton, a prominent Oliver Orchardist. It's like the buildings were, were just moved. Uh, the Presbyterian Church has got a bit of a story to it. Um, it received the uh, nickname the Blasted Church uh, because in a, after Fairview died out and it was sitting there, and it, be, it became the property of the United Church. And, um, well, no, anyway, the people in OK Falls wanted the, uh, a church, and they wanted this, they saw they're going to move this vacated church building from Fairview to OK Falls. And what they did was they boarded up the windows and tried to seal everything and closed the doors and they hugged some sticks of dynamite from the ceiling to loosen all the, na the nails to make it more uh, easier to disassemble. And it, it, this is what they did. And it had, it had the nickname Blasted Church. And it, it still um, sits, it's still used as the United Church in uh, Okanagan Falls right now. And, some of the original pews, which were made by some Fairview people, are still in use in that church by the Madden family. Uh, there's a winery that's picked up the name Blasted Church, but it's a rather interesting story. And if anybody knows where the Fairview kiosk is, that is on the same site where the, uh, this Presbyterian church was built. And, you know, the churches had choirs, Sunday schools, and hosted social events, but I think... So there was a community, but I still think it, they probably would have liked to have more people. Like sometimes not as many people going to church now as the churches would like. I think that was even a problem in those days. Now this is, it's not a good picture. It's an old photograph, but this is a picture of the uh, Presbyterian Purge Church taken in 1915. 
it has, it has a steeple and everything like that. It, when it was built, it had white clapboard siding. It was quite a smart looking building. Um, there is an old cemetery at Fairview, which is basically a piece of grazing lands which has been fenced off. And, and uh, I know of about at least 50 people that were buried there. It's never been designated as a ceremony, as a cemetery. There's no um, headstones or anything like that. Um, the, on the right, there's that little fenced area there, a metal fence. And as a kid, I'd go up there and we'd see that. And, and this sort of, I always thought it was this like a urban myth, but it's a rural myth that some children that died in a epidemic are buried there. And then as I start researching it, I realize it's, it's only too true. And that was in 1893, which I think is uh, one of the earlier burials there, uh, uh, four children from the Toll family, uh, that he, Nick Toll was an early resident of Fairview and his wife, they did get diphtheria, and this is all well, doc well documented in newspapers. And they, the children were interred there. And um, it's interesting because about 15, 20 years ago, uh, these two gentlemen on the right, uh, they came to Oliver and wanted to see the old Fairview Cemetery, and the museum contacted me. And they, their grandmother was a sibling of the children that are buried in that, um, in that metal area there. They, they did a lot of family research on the Toll family. And the reason their grandmother survived, she was still in the womb when the other kids got diphtheria and died. So she, if she'd been born you know, six months earlier or something like that, she, they wouldn't have been around either. So this is a place I've been going to since I was a kid, but when you meet people that are, um, they're, they're from Idaho is where they were raised. And I heard a bit more about the Toll family where they went after they left Fairview, etc. But it sort of brings it home. I mean, we, when you go up there now, you just see a bunch of weeds and flowers. And uh, there's actually, I've got a few, I'm gonna mention a couple other people that uh, are, are buried there. I think the last person buried there was 1921 and it was Arthur Madden. Uh, there's a Madden Lake in Oliver, he was a rancher. And he um, was found frozen in a, in a sleigh. Like, it wasn't much population. He didn't live in town, lived on a small ranch on the side of town, and, he, and he, was, he was buried there. His younger brother, James Madden, is one of the first people buried in the Oliver Cemetery in town as such now. It's in an unmarked grave, but the plot is defined. Um, in 1911, a man called George Brunel died in a wagon accident, and he had a, a lot of kids, and he had a ranch near what, what we call Sawmill Lake or Brunel Lake. And, um, he was, I found out he was from Maine, and he was a, a house painter. I saw he has got a contract to paint a big building in Headley at one time. And it was a, an accident. He had a, a horse-drawn wagon that was loaded with hay, and there was an accident. He fell over and got run over by the, hay, the horses or the wagon or something. And his wife was not, not well, and with lots of kids, and it was a very sad story. And some of the children ended up going to the Children's Aid Society in Vancouver, and other children, I think, were adopted by local families, etc. But there wasn't the sort of the established welfare system we have now. Another person, and it's quite a sad story, is a <laughs> cemetery, I guess, are sad in a lot of ways. In 1913, an English, um, they found a, a person, a body on the trail between Camp McKinney and Fairview, and. Uh, he was beside a campfire, and he looked pretty rough, and he was dead. And then the, the road crew said they'd seen this fellow walking a day or two before, and they thought he was drunk. He was sort of stumbling along. And what he, he did stuff, have some identification on him. And he was a civil engineer. It's like what we call a remittance man. He was from Britain. He had an education. He'd come to the West to make money. And uh, he, he was unemployed, too proud to ask for work. I guess he'd been at Camp McKinney trying to find work, hadn't had a meal for days. He's walking to Fairview to find work. He builds a campfire one night, falls asleep, and doesn't wake up. So he's buried in the Fairview Cemetery. And they did find an address on his pocket, and they could, they could contact his parents in England. Um, and the Toll children in 1892, I talked about them. They're Tom and Jim Waldron is, are their names. And... Uh, after the Toll family left Fairview a couple, about a year or two later, they had a hotel at Anaconda near Greenwood. They went down to Montana and ended up in Idaho. They were just sort of a big family following the, the pioneer days. As I said, about 50 people there, at least 50 people buried there. Um, 
this is basically the town site today. This is the kiosk with murals. The Okanagan Historical Society acquired the two lots which the Presbyterian Church was on. Uh, they, we own it. We had this kiosk built. Uh, the murals are actually quite valuable and they're, it's quite interesting and it, it says a bit about Fairview. It's, it's a pretty basic uh, site, site, but that, that's what's there. These are, um, I didn't give you any clues in the talk, but um, anybody want to make a guess what the population was of Fairview at its peak in 1898? Okay. Next slide we're going to find out. How about what was the price of gold at this time? Pretty close. And how much were miners paid per day? Bit more on that, John. Gold was valued statutorily at roughly twenty-one dollars and three cents, twenty dollars an ounce. And those are the, the miners. In 1907, when the stem winder was, it, it shut down very shortly after that. But they had plans of, of, of continuing on with it. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I guess you have to pay people to do it. That's basically it for the uh, presentation.